I'm Laura Vinroot Pool of Capital, and this is What We Wore. JJ Martin is the founder and designer of La Double J and our guest from season four. We hope you find inspiration in this episode from the archives as JJ first shares embarking on a spiritual journey that's now become fully integrated into her work and community. JJ Martin, I'm so excited to be talking to you. You're in Milan and I'm in Charlotte. I wish you were here in person, but happy to be talking to you today. I am so happy to be here too. Thank you guys for calling and I'm getting <laughs> everyone a big hug from Milan where I've been under lockdown for about two months now. And you have a new baby. You have a new puppy that you got when, like a year ago? Yeah, she's a year and a half and I have to say that that was, you know, I couldn't have children and yes. I know how like silly I sound by saying this, but I finally feel like I became the mother to a creature <laughs> and it has been so meaningful on so many levels of just caring for I mean certainly my company was one of a creation that yeah. feels a lot like a, a baby and and my company feels like a family that I take care of but mm-hmm. literally having like a living breathing animal <laughs> that I have to take care of and that like only just looks at me every day like well what are we doing today you know <laughs> It is good. So it she has just busted my heart open. Well, can you imagine going through the pandemic without an animal? I just I I can't fathom it. I think it would have been very, very difficult for me. I have already found it to be quite challenging. Like on some levels, I have been illuminated and adoring the isolation and you know, my spiritual practice is through the roof. I'm having these crazy visions and like downloads <laughs> and I'm, I'm loving it. And then I've also had moments of depression and anger and, you know, just so much going on. And, yeah. and this animal has accompanied me through my worst moments, which included being splattered across my kitchen floor and like <laughs> crying and slobbering one night. I do think that, like, I will look at my cats after this is over and be like, remember that time? Like, we were, you know, we were together. I mean, like, nobody else can understand what we've been through. Totally. So tell me, do you have friendly cats? Do you feel like they emote? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they're people. They're they're Siberian cats. So they're like, they're sort of like dogs. They play fetch and they greet you at the door when you drive up. And uh, they're weird. They're, and yeah, they're little people. We think they're the cat ambassadors for people that don't like cats. Is there anything that you've been wearing more than anything else during lockdown? Well, I will admit that like from the waist down, I'm typically in sweatpants. And (laughs) usually from the waist up, I usually will wear like a double J silk shirt or cotton printed shirt. And it just Mm -hmm. honestly, bright. I cannot believe what a mood booster print and color are. It's so true. It's so true. We've always known that, though. <laughs> I know. Well, and you, your shop is so color-based, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it and it still is, and it always will be. So what are you wearing? I'm wearing a lot of Dries, weirdly, like a good bit of Balenciaga, which is kind of shredded and folded up and rolled up, and you can kind of mess with it. I'm wearing Tevas, um, like Arizona Love, you know, <laughs> fabric wrap Tevas. I really am getting dressed every day and I kind of have the whole time because of Zoom calls, but just because of life. I don't know. I, well, I don't do well in sweats. <laughs> yeah, and there's such a sense of self-respect that you give yourself when you um, self-care. And by that, I mean like you know, lovingly apply lotion to your body and take long, Mm -hmm. luxurious baths and dress with care. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's it's a whole vibration. Yeah. It's a good vibration. You're from LA. I want to hear what's your first fashion memory. Were you always into fashion? So I grew up in a very masculine non-fashion family. I mean, you have brothers. I have two older brothers yeah. Uh, my father was a hunter, a fisherman, took us on <laughs> camping trips. I was always dressed in my brother's hand-me-downs. My mom <laughs> did not have a fashionable bone in her body. She cut my hair into a bowl cut and dressed <laughs> me in, like, I'll never forget, in first grade, we had to come for our 
a portrait and I went to a, a Catholic school where we, we had uniforms, but on the picture day, you could wear whatever you wanted. And my best friend came in this like ruffled, gossamer, pink, floaty dress. And I was wearing this like tomboy denim outfit. And I was so furious. I really felt, you know, trapped in this like tomboy existence that wasn't something that I wanted. And I was always attracted to fashion, always attracted to jewelry. All my other friends, mothers, you know, we'd go into their closets, we'd dress up, but I I never really had a real channel for that. You know, Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't really have any guides. I didn't have that amazingly chic grandmother or aunt that really showed me the way, but it was just something that I always loved. And what happened was... After graduating from college, I knew that I wanted to get in, you know, I had, I had majored at, uh, I I went to college in California as well. I went to UC Berkeley Mm -hmm. and I majored in rhetoric because I thought I wanted to become a lawyer. And after my (laughs) first legal theory class, I threw that idea right out the window. I was like, this is so painfully boring. I want nothing to do with this. But I, I continued with the rhetoric major. And that actually became very helpful later when I became a journalist because rhetoric was all about... Uh, argumentative writing and or critical writing and speaking. It really helped craft my communication skills, I think. And so that was kind of, you know, one thing I always tell young people, it's like the choices you make, even though they feel like they're a mistake, they're always paving your path to where you need to go. And you'll always go back and use one of those resources. So that's something that really happened, even though I had wanted nothing to do with being a lawyer and in San Francisco after at that time, there was no real fashion scene. I mean, I think Esprit had its headquarters there and maybe yeah. the Gap, but there like nothing else really. And so I got into the next closest creative field, which was advertising, which um, mm-hmm. San Francisco was just a hotbed of these yeah, for sure. small boutique, cool ad agencies. And I just loved it. I mean, I started out on the account side, but it was really the creativity and working with the creative teams, the copywriters, the art directors that I just loved. And from there, I moved to New York with another ad agency. And lo and behold, we got the Tommy Hilfiger account. (laughs) And so that was my very first experience of working with a fashion brand. So I got some experience for about a year of doing that. And from there, I think I just randomly applied for a job at Calvin Klein in their marketing department. And I got it. And so I worked at Calvin Klein in New York for two years, I think. And that was like the height of Calvin, wasn't it? Yes, it was, you know, Calvin was there, but he was, it was not his finest hour. He was really struggling, I think, with addiction at that time. And so he wasn't very present. You know, it was just a weird kind of transition time. It was 99, 2000, and then in August of 2001, that's when I moved to Italy. What prompted the move to Italy? And had you been writing during that time at all? This is a funny story. So what happened was I had had no writing background. I arrived in Italy. I had met an Italian man. I moved there for love. And I (laughs) I signed up for Italian, intense Italian lessons that I took six (laughs) hours per day for three months, (laughs) one-on-one. So it was, I had three different teachers per day. Yeah, it was, I I felt like I really had to commit to it or it wasn't going to happen. And uh, so I I dove into that. And while that was happening, I was looking for a job. And what I quickly discovered was that in 2001 in Italy, there wasn't a single fashion company that had a marketing department. Right. And they had never heard of that word. They didn't know where to place me. I was confusing to them. And, you know, (laughs) of course I thought that this was like, the death of me. This was the worst thing ever. I was going to be a failure. You know what I mean? Like, this is what goes through your mind. And I didn't have any friends. And like, this is like, why did I move here? My soon to be husband was always working, blah, 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 blah. So cut to, I'm randomly at like a C-level fashion show that I wasn't even that excited about. You know, it's like, whatever. I was a guest (laughs) of a guest. And I'm afterwards at the bar and this Irishman and I strike up a conversation and it turns out it's Godfrey Dini. And oh, yeah. he was the Love him. Uh, 
oh God, he's hilarious. And at the time, you know, he was the editor in chief of the world's first fashion news online service, which was called right. Fashion Wire Daily. Yep. And lo and behold, he was looking for a writer in Milan. And he asked me to write up a review of the show that I had just watched. And I was like, <laughs> was, it, was the show good or no? I mean, in, in reality, it was more of a presentation. So I just kind of like, you know, I gave a lot of like flavor and the party and blah, blah, blah. blah. And then and the next day he said, you're hired. And so <laughs> I, I went from having zero experience to literally going into press briefings for the Prada IPO, uh, <laughs> Domenico Dufole giving his earnings reports on Gucci. Oh my um, God interviewing Victoria Beckham in the front row of the Dolce & Gabbana show, uh, <laughs> asking her what she ate for breakfast. I mean, this was my job. Wow. That's amazing. I had no idea that's how you started. That's how I started. And again, like, you know, this is a, a funny story too. Look, Fashion Wire Daily was, it was a website. And in 2001, it was not cool to be working for a website. Nobody right. took these news uh, sources seriously. And so, you know, that kind of wreaked havoc on my own self-worth and my own sense of value, especially since it was so painful to be taken seriously by any of the PR houses or the designers. No one agreed to interviews. It was just very challenging. You know, I was mm -hmm. always granted, I mean, I barely got fashion show tickets. And when I did, they were always standing in the back. <laughs> That's okay. Know. You're really tall. <laughs> Well, exactly. But you know how fashion is. It's a yes, very I do. hierarchical, it's a very kind of snooty, snobby thing. And yeah. I was at the bargain basement bottom floor. <laughs> <laughs> and no one was reading my articles except one person. And the only person that was reading my articles was Susie Menkes. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I know. So it turned out that she was kind of jealous because we were scooping her on the news. Oh, wow. Amazing. And so she would read and then like, she'd nudge up to me at the shows and be like, I like what you wrote about Alberta Ferretti or, <laughs> or I agreed with your Moschino review. It was the pit. Well, it was so, you're so much scrappier, like able to be so much scrappier because you had to be. Exactly. And the crazy thing was that a year later, she asked me to write for her. At the Herald wow. Tribune. So once that window opened, you know, I kind of went from like the world's worst job to like one of like the coveted <laughs> ones. And then from there, I was, I worked on staff at Harper's Bazaar in the U.S. Uh, for five years. And then I was with Wallpaper for eight years and the Wall Street Journal magazine for three years. Wow. How did this turn into La Double J? And how did you know you were done with that side of fashion? Well, I don't know, like, I, I don't know how you feel. I just started getting these inklings five or six years ago that like the world was changing. I was getting tired of writing the same stories about the same people that were advertisers mm -hmm. in the magazine. It just felt like it didn't feel as exciting and creative as it once was. Or as important. Yeah, I was just losing a little bit of my like excitement for what it was. Like at the beginning in 2003, it was like the world was awaiting, you know, and I, I couldn't wait to peel back every layer of fashion and get my education. And I'm so grateful mm -hmm. for all of that because, you know, when you become a journalist, like that's essentially like going to fashion school and mm -hmm. getting a degree in interior design and architecture when you literally have to interview 65 architects in the course <laughs> of five days for Wallpaper Magazine during the Salone del Mobile. You know what right. I mean? So it was, like, it was super. That's the, cool. Yeah. As a journalist, you become the expert in those fields. And so mm -hmm. you know, I felt super grateful for that. And then it just kind of started to feel a little bit like I'm doing the same thing over and over again, Groundhog Day. My husband at the time, we've since separated, he had an e-commerce business mm -hmm. and he was the one who kept saying, you know, JJ, you should really do something with your vintage online, especially all those vintage jewels. I think you could start selling it online. And you had been a big collector from New York, from the Chelsea Flea, right? Yeah. So I had started there I collecting, you know, the fur coats and the 1940s evening <laughs> gowns. And then 
as I came to Italy, I started getting a little bit more professional about it and going to auctions and trade Mm -hmm. shows. And I had, had amassed a really nice collection of vintage clothes. And I had also made friends with a lot of dealers, you know, so he planted this idea in my head. And then of course it morphed in, then I took it and like did a spin cycle on it. And I'm like, well, if we're going to sell vintage, it needs to be mixed with new clothes and it needs to be worn on real women. And let's do it like on the creative women in Milan. And then let's show their homes and how they cook and what they cook and how they set the table. And I want to see their closets and like, let this be an ode to Italy as well as vintage. And And I remember that part of it. And I remember being, it was like, you sort of teased the launch of it. And I remember being so excited about it. I mean, like nothing like that had ever been done. I feel like it felt pretty fresh because we, Mm -hmm. we received such an incredible response to Double J when it first started because it was so wacky, you know, it was like fun <laughs> and girlfriendy and the pictures were wild. And I had this amazing fashion and styling team, Viviana and Alberto, mm-hmm. who were helping me with all the pictures. And we were creating this like very jazzy online magazine. It and was beautiful. It was super fun. But then Laura, as you know, because you're a business <laughs> owner, this thing has to make money. And there's a real challenge with vintage. Right. Just because you don't have multiples exactly. and fit. And and also really with fabric, uh, I think just deterioration, I guess, you know, or just. You, you nailed it. All three of those were major considerations. So you started to manufacture things that were similar to things that you had in your closet that, or, or what? Well, we just started with one dress. It was actually a, oh, wow. a very simple model. It was a vintage dress that. I was like, this is such a great shape. And Viviana was like, oh my gosh, this is the one. Let's do it. And we did this short sleeve, A-shaped floor length dress. And I went to our friends at Mantero Secta, which is one of the oldest silk manufacturers on Lake Como. And I asked them, hey guys, can we jump into your archive and use some vintage prints and use you guys to manufacture uh, silk? And we want to promote you. We'll talk about you. We'll talk about your archive. And they were thrilled because this is a company wow. that's been around for over a hundred years, but none right. of the big brands, like if you go into their factory, you see things being printed for Gucci, Vuitton, Dior, but none mm-hmm. of those brands talk about Mantero. Right. <laughs> so, so I said, Hey, like, you know, let's, let's talk about you guys. Like let's, I, before I had shined the light on the Italian women, let's shine the light on the Italian manufacturers. So we started mm-hmm. with one dress, then that morphed into a skirt and a shirt, which you must remember. You yes, I do. <laughs> and I sold <laughs> 1 million of them. <laughs> yeah. And it was just so cute because it was like people like you who just got it were on board immediately, even though we were mm-hmm. this like super boutique production and didn't know what the heck we were doing had like nobody really handling you know the the production side of things and then finally we got Riley on board for sales but like Mm -hmm. she was a freelancer everyone everyone has been a freelancer on this (laughs) journey you know but then Mm -hmm. slowly but surely it all morphed and then we introduced home And then we introduce different categories, but all along we've been partnering with historic Italian manufacturers to do it and trying to support them and talk about them. So it's always a co-branding. And speaking of Montero, how are they? So they reopened partly on Monday and, you know, I spoke with Franco Montero, who is like the great, great grandson or whatever of the founder. You know, they're one of the big companies in Italy. They have like, I can't remember, I think it's like 2000 employees or something like that. They're like a big structure. Mm -hmm. And he was torn up in bits about Mm -hmm. not being able to pay people and like Mm -hmm. put, you know, because one thing that's also really nice about Italy is that we just don't go immediately into like firing people. Right. No, it takes a long time. (laughs) It takes a long time. In any case, like it's very difficult to fire people in Italy, even if you wanted to. Um, But in a situation like this, it's really nice that, you know, people do have stability with their jobs. We've, all of us, Mentero included, Double J included, has had to kind of go on a temporary suspension of activity Mm -hmm. just because 
you know, the lights have been turned out in every yeah. single company for the last six weeks, if not yeah. more. Yeah. Tell me about what it's like for you guys. We're just a few weeks behind you, you know? I mean, I think it's the same. We've been, we've been in our homes for, I mean, almost two months, I guess. Yeah. It's crazy and it's scary and it's exhilarating in a weird way. It's exciting in a weird way to be able to reinvent and to be able to innovate and to think in new ways for me. Also, a lot of fear around what it's going to be like when we do reopen. I mean, yeah. will people even be coming? I don't even know how what that looks like, you know? Yeah. And, and do people even want to shop? Yeah, who knows? I don't know. I mean, I, I have to say I came in the store. I, I've, I've been coming in the store because I live a block away and the clothes are really wearable. I mean, I feel really positive about what we have in the store, that they're relevant, they're in touch for some reason. I don't, not that, I mean, I, I think it's sort of a trend that we started to see and feel that we wanted things to be more mm, natural and wearable. Easy. Yeah. 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 So I, I I feel really good about that. But again, like, who knows? I mean, nobody knows. I'm working on slogan t-shirts right now that will be <laughs> like, I have, I have one t-shirt that I'm dying to wear that says ready to resurrect. And, <laughs> and then I've, I've been toying around with a couple ideas, like since I don't have children, but my friends, they just look like angels. So I'm saying like quarantine parenting has made me an offended master. I feel well, like yeah. I mean, there's just so many fun things to like, you know, we, we all have to kind of raise each other's spirits, you know? And, yeah. Um, and I, and I think you've done such an incredible job and it seems like you've really found um, a little bit of a new calling and, and honestly, JJ being sort of a spiritual guide to people. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. I mean, to be perfectly honest, like I'd love to become a life coach, you know, yeah. or <laughs> yeah. to be honest, because I feel like that's actually the thing that I do best. And whenever mm -hmm. I meet people, I get, I get these like imprints immediately upon meeting people about what they need. And in the past, you know, I've been so bossy that probably no one was ever <laughs> listening to what I really had to say because I was <laughs> delivering it in such a crappy way. I really realized that I think I can help people because I mm -hmm. myself went through a lot. Uh, in my life, there was a lot of hardship that I had to go through. Tell me how it started. So I lost a parent when I was young. Mm -hmm. My father got leukemia when I was 16 and then he died at 19. And it was kind of this like wow. taboo topic. And I kind of come mm -hmm. from a family of like not really sharing things. And, you know, so this whole idea of like, <laughs> I can't believe you're not Southern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just put on a happy face. Right. <laughs> yeah. So there's so much that went wrong in me trying to deal with that. Like a lot of it, you know, I, I suffered with depression for many years. And, I did too. I get and it. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it, Laura, but like what didn't work for me was the traditional psychoanalysis no. medication. It was no medication. Very, yeah, it was very, it just mm. kind of put me into a sleepwalking mode and mm -hmm. never really made me get into touch with my actual emotional states and yeah. learn how to accept myself and cultivate an inner compassion and forgiveness when I was feeling sad, mad, helpless, pain, whatever. And that's the real trick. And I don't feel like maybe there are now, but when I was kind of like going through all this, there just weren't enough people talking about this. No. Meditation and yoga has existed for hundreds of thousands of years, I guess, but there, that wasn't accepted and that wasn't encouraged. So that was never like an option, right? Exactly. Or no one even like put the two and two together. I mean, I'll never forget when I was in like the depths of one of my depressions, I was probably just eating like a pound of candy a day and that's it. <laughs> and no doctor ever asked me what I was eating. That's crazy. To anyone who's listening, I mean, the number one step if you're feeling depressed is no alcohol and no sugar under any circumstances. That's like right. my number one rule because mm -hmm. they so mess with your inner compass and your inner levels of equilibrium. And I am convinced, Laura, that people that suffer from depression are empaths to begin with. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. We feel things so much more than the average person does. Mm-hmm. And an empath needs to start learning how to use their empathic power. And basically, sugar and alcohol turns that off. Right. I'm a I'm a diagnosed HSP, a highly sensitive person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so I, I have the exact same thing. Like I'm a full fledged, like hardcore empath too. It's like any <laughs> substance that goes into me is like, and any emotion, like I can feel the emotion of the guy across the street. Of course. You know? Yeah. Same. And, so, yeah. and so no one explained that to me until like probably like five years ago. Mm-hmm. And that just opened up a whole new world. And contemporaneously with all of this, I was diving into energy healing because a third thing, you know, apart from the depressions and apart from the death of my father and then not talking about it, there was my infertility that was a huge source of frustration, pain, Mm -hmm. confusion, made it so difficult for me to maintain a closeness with my husband, like emotionally, Mm -hmm. everything. It was just, it was such a destabilizer. And you have absolutely no control over it. Oh my God. You have no control. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the moment that really you need to practice self-compassion and mercy. Yeah. And just give yourself a goddamn break. And like no one was talking that way. I, there weren't any support groups. Like no one discussed this. It was like, wham, bam, like you should just be in and out of the IVF thing and like to make it happen. And instead that's not what happens. And so, you know, what happens when we can't get what we want? What happens like as an American, when you can't <laughs> work hard and you don't get what you, you know, what you want, it's like a very complicated thing. And so you what know? was it that opened the door to all of that? So what happened was, you know, the the thing that opened the door to that was heart wrenching pain and anger that made me finally take out my sword and cut the cords with all these Western doctors and this (laughs) fake way of getting pregnant, which for me was like wreaking havoc on my overly sensitive body. You know, one of the things that I, I learned much later is for me. I'm I'm not going to say this is true for everyone. For me, there was a very good reason why I wasn't getting pregnant. Okay. Mm. There was a very good reason. And the, and the reason is that my, my body is responding to my mental activity, my emotional activity, my spiritual Mm -hmm. activity, my soul Mm -hmm. activity, my inner child, my astral levels, et cetera. And if I am not in alignment, like a baby was not going to come through. It just wasn't right. Right. And I learned, I started learning about that. um, Literally the day I decided to get rid of all those doctors was the day I found out about this energy healer. Same day. Hmm. She was based in Petaluma. I was in California visiting some friends. They put me in touch with her and I started these remote Skype calls with her from Italy to Petaluma, California. Mm -hmm. And she changed my life. Mm -hmm. She really did. I mean, she introduced me to the concept of God. I was raised a Catholic and like, I was so like completely turned off by the idea of God of any kind. I was like, this God business is bullshit. That's what I thought. (laughs) She was the one who really started opening me back up to this idea of like source energy and whether you want to call it the divine or whether you want to call it God or Jesus, or maybe you're into Buddha, or maybe you're into a pink elephant. I don't care what you're into. You know, maybe it's just the sky and the mountains, the most beautiful mountains in the world. It's the earth. We have got to get in touch with this creator energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what she helped me do. And from there, it was just like, bang, 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 doors opening, doors opening. I started seeing shamans. I started seeing, I started taking theta healing courses. I joined a Yanni group, started doing ovarian breathing exercises, which has like been honestly one of the most radical transformational things I've done since I started. Because I've I've heard that. Have you heard of it? Well, I've heard, I have a friend who works with a pelvic floor therapist, and she says the same thing. Like, it, it changed everything in her life. 
So what happens as women, which we don't realize, is that we are, I mean, let's be honest, we are way more powerful creators than men are just because of our natural born capacity to bring life into the world with, with human beings. Okay. So women are already at an advantage of that. And your womb is the magic cave that makes that happen. It's not just a cave for incubating children. It's also a cave for incubating projects, ideas, creativity, yeah. Multitasking, new companies, new friends, like the whole Mm -hmm. shebang. On the Mm -hmm. flip side, it is also a place that incubates any repressed emotions, any pain that has gone unconfronted. It is like the, it can be the garbage dump of your entire celestial being. And this is what women don't realize is how much garbage they have collected down there. Yeah. And it's really the ovarian breathing that allows you to start opening the windows and just letting the smog and the fog and the gunk out and letting the fresh air and the clean water. And when you start doing these meditations, I mean, it's just, it's really remarkable. And I am going to raise 10 hands and attest to how much this works. And I have like no reason (laughs) to say that. Like there's no, like I I just want to be of service to people to tell them about this because it's it was so- this in Italy was this an Italian um- yes it was done in Italy with a girl who so I have my two Yanni that they have my Yanni group is made up of a girl that's based in Milan and a girl that's based in India but they're both mm-hmm. like from Milan and we started in these like really kind of rinky dink like someone's like tiny cramped apartment like it was not <laughs> a plush goop like workshop. Okay. <laughs> it was like, there was no like five star anything. Gwyneth Paltrow did not arrive. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was like in the dark, in kind of a cramped like farmhouse that was filled with cockroaches. It was hysterical. <laughs> and then it became so amazing that, that, that more people came and then it became like a bigger thing and nicer, well, nicer places. Not- that was just one of the places that they do it because it's like a friend of theirs house who's also a friend of mine who I adore. And and they we have like a WhatsApp chat group. Mm-hmm. There are Zoom calls that we do. I'm going to do two breathing uh, sessions this weekend. I mean, but I got to tell you, it's very hard work. It is, it's almost more taxing for me to do an ovarian breathing session than to like go out and like put my running shoes on and go jogging after like not having done that in five years. Like I'd almost wow. rather go jogging. You're basically doing very deep breathing through your mouth to the point where you're taking in so much oxygen, you're doing it very fast. So the breathing is, it sounds like this. <sighs> okay. And it's almost mm-hmm. like you're going to hyperventilate, but you don't because you're laying down. The first time I did this, I, you know, what happens is you go into a trance totally. and you start zooming off because your head is so turned off and your body <laughs> is pumped with oxygen and mm-hmm. you can start getting into this state that mm-hmm. allows you to really come into contact with what you can call your higher self, your spirit, your soul. And mm-hmm. you can really break down all the bullshit and all of like the mental constructs of what's going on in your life when you do this. So mm-hmm. I was introduced to that maybe like seven years ago in meditation. And then this ovarian breathing, you do that exact same breathing technique, but you put all of your focus and your intention on your womb and the teacher is guiding you. So she's kind of doing this like guided visualization and she's putting music on. It's super intense. It's quite tribal at times. It's a little bit animalistic at times. It's very wild woman. I don't know if you've ever Mm. read the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Of course I have. (laughs) I read it all the time. (laughs) Okay. So that book is very much connected to this kind of work. It's about bringing up the wild woman. Right. I love it. JJ, I feel like you need to move into coaching. (laughs) My dream is to find an old convent or monastery in Sicily 
and I want to renovate it. I want to create like a working farmy kind of thing, vegetable garden, like, you know, whatever is local growing there. I'd love to have like English lessons for the local kids down there as well. And then I want to use it as a, a retreat site in which I invite various people to come and I will be there really share this information and I don't want it to be something fancy and expensive I want it to be like very because I have I mean although you know we love fancy and expensive too don't we like we really (laughs) do but I also think that there's also something to be said for opposite side of the spectrum. And sometimes we need to get away from our fanciness and we need to get away from our luxury and we need to tap into the core of who we are. And the way we do that is getting back to nature. That's Mm -hmm. number one. We have got to get back connected to the earth, connected to her creations. One thing that helped me tremendously, I don't know if it helped you with depression, I mean, sitting against a tree and putting Mm -hmm. my bare feet in grass or soil, it can change everything. It's it's grounding. It's, it's real. Hugging a tree. (laughs) Yeah. So this is, so this is my goal, but you know. And so where does fashion fit into that? (laughs) I don't know. And like, what am I doing right now? It's like all the stores are belly up or we don't have any money. Like. (laughs) So well, I'm just, I'll, I'll be your first visitor to Sicily to the conscious breath work. Yanni retreat. <laughs> I'm so glad to know I have it. Okay. I'm signing you up. Good. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, in the meantime, what I'm doing is I'm just starting to share a little bit of my own journey, my own process work on Instagram. And it's been fun over the lockdown. We started doing some of this on Double J Instagram, on my Instagram, our newsletters. Like I just wrote a chakra newsletter that's going to come out next week. Cool. And have you been surprised at the response? Yes. I mean, people <laughs> love it. And, and it's so cute because then, you know, I get a lot of like public comments. And then my private message box has so many stories in it. And it's just yeah. really who want to connect. They want some understanding. And, and I love that. Like I stay up at yeah. night, like in alone in my home and I'm like talk chatting with women. I don't know. And giving them advice. The only reason I do that, Laura, honestly, is because like, I have been there. I have been in that mm-hmm. pit of despair. I've been buried underground, unable to breathe, feeling like bug juice splattered on my kitchen floor <laughs> like I was earlier in the week like it happened yeah. and I I know exactly what it feels like it feels like death has come to you while your eyes are still open and you don't even know what to do and you think that there is something you've done wrong and you're a failure and you begin to punish yourself and it's this terrible cycle that we put ourselves through only because that's what we were taught and we have to reprogram ourselves. I think it's really funny, amazing, interesting that this comes, this sort of channel has come through fashion to a place where you're really not allowed to talk about how you feel or, or reality or, you know, things like that. And so I think people are so relieved to have one person say, guess what? Like everything is not perfect. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was one of the videos that did the best when I was like, this fucking sucks. <laughs> I got like, I got so many responses to that. And then I did this other video where it was like, you know what? Fashion is not the only game in town. Everyone who works in fashion is so frightened of leaving it because they think, you know, that there's nothing else. And it's like, let's look at this as one of the many things that brings us joy. And when you're holding on so tightly to something, when your identity is so wrapped up in that and your importance is so tied to who you know and what parties you're invited to and did you get invited to that fashion show and does that magazine want to write about you, it really takes your eyes off the real prize. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. (laughs) No, but I I get it. I mean, I still face that difficulty and I feel like I have a a level of consciousness that has grown exponentially and Mm. I still feel these chains of fear that like Mm -hmm. keep me back, you know? 
Yeah. It was it was really hard for me to leave those journalism jobs. And I just remember having my identity so closely connected with my job. And and that's what we need to change. Your job is a a happy extension of your baseline. And let's get the baseline cleaned up, cleared up, really rooted and grounded. That way Mm -hmm. you're going to do well, whether you're on the front row of Fendi or in like, (laughs) you know, like some rinky dink town, just like cruising the street by yourself. You're good to go. (laughs) Yeah. This is not who you are. Yeah. Well, I have loved, loved, loved talking to you. You really should be a coach because I would like to talk to you every day for about an hour (laughs) (laughs) to get get me ready. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Um, I honestly, I mean, if you want to do anything else around this, I'm very, because I'm super, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how, I don't have the plan. I don't have the book agent. I don't have like anything. But I also think that's the exhilarating part, you know, that that the possibilities are endless. I mean, I don't know. You can dream, you can, you can create a new reality. And that, that, that's what's so exciting about this for me. One of the things we ask everybody on our podcast is what did you wear to the prom? And I cannot wait to hear what you wore to the prom. Oh my God. (laughs) Which prom? Um, Uh, Exactly. I'm sure you went to many. (laughs) So I went through this phase. You're going to laugh so hard. All right. I was a competitive gymnast in high school, which means that, that, yeah, I did competitive gymnastics for 10 years and I was the tallest one in the history (laughs) of gymnastics. Um, But this also meant that I had like 3% body fat and no boobs. And I was so mortified (laughs) that I actually looked like a boy, you know, like my family, like always treated me like a boy. And I now look like one, (laughs) you know, for the dresses, it was always so complicated because like everyone was wearing these strapless colorful dresses, but like I wouldn't (laughs) fill out the boob section. And so what happened was I remember I wore several dresses that had big, like, 1980s Ungaro bows. Oh my God, I love. <laughs> like it was kind of like a tubey dress in velvet. Mm-hmm. And then it had this like huge green taffeta bow over the over the boobs. And I think I got that at the brass plum. And was the dress, was the velvet black or was it green? Black. It was black oh, velvet and then it had a green taffeta bow. And I'm pretty sure this came from brass plum at Nordstrom's. I love it. I love that question, though. Have you gotten some fun answers? Oh, my gosh. It's so much fun. It, yes, yeah, some hilarious answers. Did you have any special jewelry or shoes or hair? Do you remember? Okay, so it was a big deal when I was, because I'm old. I don't know how old you are. I think you're younger. I'm your age. No, we're the same age. <laughs> so I, was, I graduated from high school in 1991. And I, graduated from I'm older. <laughs> okay, you definitely look younger, but that's okay. <laughs> It was important to dye your shoe to match your dress. Did you do this? Obviously, yes. Oh, okay. Dye to so, match. <laughs> yeah, we did this. So we had these like really ugly, like pointed toe <laughs> pumps that yeah, then satin. Got, yeah, that were satin that you dyed to match the color of your dress. That's what we yes. Did. And did you match it to the green or the black? I think that one I did black, but I remember okay. I had a pink dress because we had lots of. I went to an all girls school. Oh, so you had a lot of. Yes, yeah, so we had, a, you lot. had a lot. Went to a lot of boys' school proms, right? Yeah, we went to so many of these. So I'm, I'm trying to even remember <laughs> like what was my prom because there were so many. Even starting in the seventh grade, there was like semi-formal and formal and <laughs> there were so many of these things. And you better believe that was like the highlight of my life going to. <laughs> well, because you didn't have to wear your uniform. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, JJ, I have loved talking to you. Me too. Let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting, was composed and performed by Britt Drozda. Please follow us on Instagram at What We Wore Podcast for additional content and show updates. QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. dot com.